As I thought about this question, what Jodo Shinshu means to me, um, I began thinking more about uh, kind of where I began uh, when I first encountered really Jodo Shinshu and encountered uh, these teachings that um, bring us all together here. And so as a, as a young um, recent college graduate, uh, back in 1997, um, I lived across the street from Mo'ili Ili Honganji um, as my first apartment out of college. Um, and um, I walked across one day uh, to join them for Sunday service. And I uh, was welcomed by um, Rose Nakamura and Cindy Osajima, uh, who almost immediately asked me to become a volunteer for Project Donna. <laughs> right? You all know how that works, <laughs> right? And you never say no to Rose. So, um, but, but for me, that was a very powerful moment and a very profound moment to be able to see a faith community uh, that was actively working in the community, that was actually living out the values that they claim to hold and that they claim to possess. Um, and so for me, the idea of faith and action, the idea of service, is my path of Jodo Shinshu. Jodo Shinshu for me is a path of gratitude and a path of service. Two very simple concepts, but very hard concepts to, to kind of really actualize in our lives. And so in 1997, uh, there was a, uh, a workshop by uh, Reverend Dr. Um, Taitetsu Uno here at the Buddhist Study Center uh, where I picked this book up, the Tani Shou, uh, that he translated. And in this, um, he wrote this to me. Aim for the most important thing in life, self-awakening. I go back to this often in my life over the past 18 years or so. Um, how many of you were here in 1997 in this very room with Dr. Uno? I know Norma, Norman was, yeah. But the thing about trying to understand my spiritual journey was this. And when I had to really sit down and think about what does Jodo Shinshu mean to me, it was raising this question of what does it mean to be a follower of Shin Buddhism? What is the essence of the spiritual path that we are on? And what guidance does the Dharma share, that Shinran provided um, offer my life? And so I returned back to the Tanyu Shou and chapter one of the Tanyu Shou, which, which says this. When the thought of saying the Nembutsu erupts from deep within, having entrusted ourselves to the inconceivable power of Amida's vow, which saves us, enabling us to be born in the pure land, we receive at that very moment the ultimate benefit of being grasped, never to be abandoned. Amida's primal vow does not discriminate between young and old, good and evil. True entrusting alone is essential. The reason is that the vow is directed to the person burdened with the weight of karmic evil and burning with the flames of blind passion. Thus, in entrusting ourselves to the primal vow, no other form of good is necessary, for there is no good that surpasses the Nembutsu, and evil need not be feared, for there is no evil which can obstruct the working of Amida's primal vow. This passage from the Tani Shou for me is the beginning and the end of my path. Self-awakening means that we acknowledge and accept our limitations our foolish selves, our, our bombu nature, right? Our humanness. Self-awakening also means that we are able to live in this world of delusion with gratitude for the dynamic power of wisdom and compassion which is always supporting us. And self-awakening means that we are able to entrust in life with all its complexities and its infinite possibilities. That we are able to entrust in life with all of its complexities 
and all of its potential. According to Dr. Uno in his book, uh, River of Fire, River of Water, he talks about how traditional Buddhism, uh, monastic Buddhism, was about reaching the mountaintop and, and you know, finding that awakening up there. But the Pure Land Path takes us into the valley, into the shadow of the mountain. And that's where our path takes us, right? Through the valley of greed, hatred, ignorance. But it's also in this valley that our spiritual lives are cultivated. And it is in this valley where we are embraced by Mita Buddha, embraced by the reality of life. And so, Shin Buddhism comes alive for those of us who live in the Valley of Ignorance, right? It allows us to accept life exactly as it is and transforms the way we see ourselves and the world around us. It challenges us to discover the good in every situation and to discover meaning in our lives. Now, the Shin Buddhist path asks us to see the proverbial glass of water as not simply as being half empty or half full, but rather as having the potential to be full and having the potential to be empty, right? And this all depends on our own minds and our perception of reality and that moment that we exist and that moment we create with our minds. And our liberation is made available to us not because we are wise, but rather because we are ignorant, we are limited, imperfect, and finite. We are embraced by Mita Buddha, who is a rep representation of ultimate reality. And wisdom and compassion is an eternal and dynamic force, which makes our lives possible and helps us to free ourselves from ourselves from the boxes we create for ourselves, the cages we create for ourselves. And so, once we have this understanding of the innumerable causes and conditions that make our lives possible, blah, 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 right? All these things, right? All the good, all the bad, all the crap that happens to us, right, every day. That's when we're able to, to receive gratitude and to express gratitude. But that's not enough, though, on this path. It's not just a path of gratitude. But what do we do with gratitude? Which leads me to my next point. So we may go to church and temple and sit in the pews and feel like we're so good and we, we, we are finding calm and finding awakening and, you know, and, and but unless we act from compassion and we act from gratitude, it means nothing. How many people we know, um, you know, consider themselves good people by going to temple every you know, every week and, and um, you know doing service projects and you know oh I wrote a check to this charity, but when it comes down to it. Can you live every day of your life with gratitude? And can you act from gratitude every single day of your life? That's the challenge. So Shinru Suzuki, uh, the Zen master, said that, the, that there is no enlightened beings. There is only enlightened activity. That there are no enlightened people. There is only enlightened activity. And for me, this captures the true essence of the Dharma and how we should live and strive to live each moment of this life. The teachings should serve as a guide for us to become true and real human beings who live with wisdom and act compassionately towards others. Shakyamuni Buddha is considered the awakened one, not because he was some magical enlightened being, but rather because he was a man who practiced enlightened activity in the world in all that he did. He could have kept the truth that he discovered for himself to himself, but he spent the rest of his life teaching and sharing and practicing what he realized. 
every day of his life. He humbly and he sincerely lived his spiritual values. His life was his teaching and was the perfect expression of values in action. We often separate spiritual values from everyday life. However, these values should be the foundation from where all of our actions derive from. In Buddhism, we talk about being mindful of our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, and how they can impact our lives and lives of others. If everyone sincerely lived the values of their faith, can you imagine how truly amazing and beautiful our world could be? Last night, I had a opportunity to speak to um, a group of leaders from Local 5 uh, and the IKEA movement um, who was do they were doing a training on um, leadership development. And, and I was part of a panel discussion on faith and social justice, faith and action, and how do we live the values of our faith in the world, and what practical applications um, that has. And so we have three treasures in Buddhism, right? The Buddha, the teacher, the Dharma, the teachings, the Sangha, the community. For me, the Sangha is where the Buddha and Dharma truly exists. Our values are only as real as we put them into practice each and every day. Building community is about our commitment to sharing our values through action. At the heart of Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings is a lesson of suffering, of impermanence, of interdependence. These truths form the basis of, of my spiritual worldview and how I act in the world. Each person's suffering is real and unique, and we should cultivate a compassionate heart and extend loving kindness towards all beings equally. Because we understand the truth of impermanence, we live our life as if today is the first day of our life, and we live it as if it might be our last. If today was your last day on earth, how would you want to savor and cherish each moment? How would you treat those you love? How would you like to be remembered? Would you live with a sense of urgency? And would we do all we can to make this world just a little bit better? And because we understand interdependence, we act from the knowledge that we are truly part of the larger whole. And we must do all we can to support each other in this Saha world. In Shin Buddhism, we rely upon the vow of the Buddha as our, re as our reason for enlightenment. But isn't Amida's vow also our vow? That wish of the Buddha to save each one of us, to work for our enlightenment, for our salvation, isn't that also our wish? And shouldn't that be our wish to share that wonderful teaching with others, to share that salvation with others, that unless all beings are enlightened, I will forego my enlightenment. That is the wish that we should strive for. And so a life of gratitude should naturally and spontaneously, hopefully, result in generosity, result in compassionate action, help to soften our heart, soften our sense of our ego self, to be more loving to be more compassionate, to be of service to others. And so when we cultivate a mind of gratitude, we should share that gratitude through service to others. The spiritual liberation that is guaranteed in Shin Buddhism is not selfish. Liberation must include all beings in this world equally. The primal vow is a universal promise of salvation for all people. And so I was reading this article from Tricycle Magazine, um, and I came across some great passages. And it talked about this idea of, uh, of sharing and of generosity. And it said this, we can be generous 
with our wealth, with ourselves, and with the Dharma. In some ways, giving wealth is the easiest. If we consume less and live more frugally, we can give away what we save. It is also useful to remember that the nature of giving is not necessarily dependent on the size or the value of the gift. Once the Buddha was about to teach the Dharma to a congregation in the forest, but it got dark. Several people offered their lamps, but there was a homeless woman whose only possession was an alms bowl, which she offered to serve as an oil lamp. On realizing this, the Buddha exclaimed to the congregation that the old lady's virtue was the most excellent as she had offered her total wealth, the begging bowl. By making her offering, do you think she lost anything? And so as I think about the reason I decided to work towards Tokudo and to become ordained, I came to, there was a point in my life where I saw the truth of Amida, that Amida was real in my life. And that was when I was uh, watching my mom care for uh, my stepfather, who was dying of cancer. Watching that selfless act of love, of service and compassion to another human being, giving of yourself totally, that for me was Amida working. That for me was Amida in my life. Witnessing that pure act was the dynamic working of Amida. And so, when out of gratitude, we dedicate ourselves to benefiting others. And so, this is something that we often think that by giving something away, we end up with nothing. But in reality, the Dharma is inexhaustible. However much you give of it, you can always go back for more. Because in this well, the more you take from it, the higher the water will rise. As long as you give the Dharma to nourish others, it will be there. As long as you are alive and are able to practice this will be true. Being alive, you can learn more and more and give more and more. Being alive, you can also take time to rest and recover, then go back to the source. This is how giving the Dharma works. And so, if you light a lamp for somebody, it will also brighten your path. So, in that same article, it talked about when a candle is lit in a dark room, it illuminates the room to some extent, but its power is limited, right? One small candle in a vast darkness lights one small corner of it. But if you use the same candle to light another candle, the total brightness increases. If you continue to do that, you can fill the whole room with brilliant light and illumination. If we keep our own light, selfishly hidden, it will only provide a limited amount of light. But when we share our light with others, we do not diminish our own light, but rather we increase the amount of light available to all people. Therefore, when others light our candle, we issue forth light. When out of gratitude, we use our candle to light other people's candles, the whole room gets brighter. This kind of light is continuous and inexhaustible. I think most of you know that I'm also the chair of the Social Concerns Committee uh, for Hawaii Kyodan. And in my time serving as chair and serving in this capacity, I've been fortunate to be able to, um, to witness and to learn about the, the wonderful things that we have done in our history and that we continue to do in service to our community, in service to others. You know, our very first bishop, uh, Imamura, you know, uh, helped to um, protect and 
fight for the rights of plantation workers. Um, he worked with them, stood with them, marched with them to be able to change working conditions um, on the plantations. That is faith in action. That is dharma in action. Um, you know, I heard the story before about how we created Sunday services at a point, one, to be able to, you know, uh, acclimate to this Western culture, but two, to be able to give our workers and our parishioners a day off, just like the rest of the, the Christians um, and other um, faith groups in the islands on the plantations. That is faith in action. That is a creative way of relieving the suffering of, of people, right? And so, and like I mentioned, Project Dano, 26 years ago, founded by two Buddhist laywomen who wanted to contribute to the world around them through compassionate action, through service, by seeing a need in the community and filling that need. And our junior YBA in 2007 successfully advocated for the establishment of Peace Day in Hawaii. Also, we were a leader in the marriage equality fight in Hawaii and helped to work for relieving the suffering of other people in our community. I think these are examples of faith in action, of using our gratitude, using our compassion in a productive way, in a way that lives up to the spirit of the vow, lives up to the spirit of being a true Buddhist and being a true human. And so, as we reflect upon the idea of of building community. We build community through action. We build community through service. We build sangha through action. We build sangha through service. That's how we live the dharma, through service, through action. The dharma is shared from person to person, from heart to heart, from mind to mind. Amida's primal vow and the name, Namo Amida Butsu, is an inexhaustible source of love, an inexhaustible source of compassion, which fuels my life. But we have a responsibility of sharing that light with others. And so for me, it comes back again that the Dharma and the teachings of Jodo Shinshu is about gratitude, but it is also about service and compassionate service in our world. Thank you.